Hello and thank you for joining us for episode five of the Ready Steady Go webinar series from the Camogie Association. Today's webinar is going to look at coaching philosophies and development versus winning and trying to strike the balance between the two. Joining us today we have Mr Dave Simpson. Dave's, Dave is the head coach of the New Zealand women's lacrosse national team and he was previously the head coach of the Scotland women's lacrosse national team. I had the pleasure of working with Dave in, in 2017 uh, with the Scotland team and I was blown away by the by his coaching philosophy and the environment that he created for his players uh, that led to a very very successful campaign um, during the whole year so I'm delighted to have Dave on here to share his experiences and hopefully you'll pick up some tips uh, and things that you can use with your own with your own teams off the back of it. Episode uh, The webinar is going to be split into two parts this first part is going to focus very much on coaching philosophies coaching styles, um, how to give feedback, and just all the things that you would consider uh, for you as a coach to consider when you're trying to create uh, uh, the best environment you can for your team. Uh, episode two is then going to focus more on development versus winning and how to strike the balance between the two and the considerations when doing that. So I hope you, in, again, I hope you enjoy the episode and I'll put it over to Dave. Hello and thank you for joining us on the fifth episode of the Ready Steady Go webinar series. Today's episode is focusing on player development and coach mentoring. So we're going in a slightly different direction from the last couple of ones that we've done. We've got two core topics for you today. Topic one, we're going to look at the age old question of development versus winning for youth and adult players and how we get the balance between the two and is it even possible. And then the core topic two is going to be how to implement a successful coach mentoring system uh, either for club or for county. So hopefully you'll, you'll find a couple of things here that you can use back in your own practice. I'm delighted to be joined by our special guest today, which is Dave Simpson. Dave is the head coach of New Zealand women's national lacrosse team, currently eighth in the world rankings and preparing to compete in the world champions championships in 2021 and the world games in 2022. Prior to that, he was the head coach at the Scot Scottish lacrosse and he improved their ranking from number six to number five in the world while also earning a bronze medal at the European Championships. Dave's been coaching for nearly 40 years at all, all stages of, of, of lacrosse, recreational development, college and elite. And for the past eight years, he's been mainly focusing on the elite level in New Zealand, Scotland and the US. Absolutely delighted to have you here today. Uh, Dave, say hello to everybody for us. Just check your sound's working. Oh, hey, thanks, Stuart. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks a lot. Um, it's been fun to kind of prepare for this, to get to know the sport of camogie a little bit and see the similarities between uh, Camogie and lacrosse. In fact, there's a video on YouTube with uh, Taylor Cummings, one of the great uh, uh, U.S. lacrosse players, uh, and one of the uh, Irish Camogie players came over and they taught each other the sport. So it was fun to see. Yeah, so uh, I saw that actually. Yeah, 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 it's good stuff. So uh, uh, look, it, look it up on YouTube. Uh, Taylor Cummings and Camogie <laughs> will get you there. I know. Was anyway, thanks thanks that, for having me. I, I hadn't seen that one. I hadn't seen yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, just for, for background, so I, 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 I had the pleasure of working with Dave for the for the past four or five years as the as the physio assistant for Scottish lacrosse, and it's one of our 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 our, our many our many uh, f f philosophical talks over the over the years. A lot of it's centered on coaching, and coaching practice. That's why I was delighted to have to have Dave in here. There's a lot of similarities between uh, the systems and the and the 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 kind of philosophies that Dave's gone through with implementing for teams and things that we can use in Camogie as well. So Dave, delighted to have you here. And oh, thanks, man. Stop. Hey, can I tell just a bit of, bit of a story on you since, we, uh, since we've worked together? Uh, oh, no. So suddenly you got a, a nervous look on your face there. Uh, this wasn't part of the prep, Dave. This definitely yeah, wasn't part of the prep. That was not part of the prep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Stuart working uh, with us as a physio, besides being really technically and, and, and uh, uh, you know, being technically sound at what he does and scientifically sound, uh, really brought to us a uh, recovery and readiness program that we implemented at the last European Championships. It was this amazing science-based program that uh, just went next level and taught me so much about how to work with players when you've got these 10 day tournaments that are really brutal uh, on players' bodies and minds and how to keep them uh, recovering and keeping them ready. Uh, and I just thought it was brilliant work and I just kind of want to make sure people know you're not just a pretty face over there. <laughs> not even, not even Dave. <laughs> and I, I say, I, 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 again, thank you very much. But I, in terms of all the, for all, all, all the things we get through, the, 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 the one thing we never saw was how to stop a player's boots melting in 40 degree heat right. on an AstroTurf yeah. pitch. That's what, <laughs> that was new. We were, to, for content, we were in Israel and it was 37 degrees most of the time. Uh, tough one. Uh, for, 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 for Dave being from California, it was fine. For me being a pasty Scottish person, it didn't quite go so well. <laughs> um, 
So Dave, I'll start off on now. So first question was, um, your coaching philosophy, Inja, if you could sum it up uh, really for us, particularly in relation to developing uh, youth and developing adult players. Um, if you just wanted to give us a few words about, about how you go about things and, and what you think is the most important, most important yeah. points from a coaching point of view. Yeah, glad to, Stuart. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about my, uh, my journey as a coach. Uh, so when I was a young athlete coming up in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, the coaches at, at that time in the U.S. came from like a military perspective. I mean, it was an authoritarian, authoritarian program. There was no relationship between the player and the coach. And, um, you know, you were at practices, it was um, the practice that you run until you throw up. Um, if you hit in the head and you see stars, you know, suck it up and get back in. Um, that was the nature of the coaching. And um, I'm a parent and it's a little bit like parenting where uh, you find yourself parenting like your parents did. And I think it's the same for coaches. Uh, you know, what role models do we have as coaches? Is the coaches the coach does and the ones we see on television? Um, and they're probably both not the best examples when you're a, a development coach working with kids and, and otherwise. So um, I was fortunate enough when I was 21 to have a mentor uh, that re really taught me a lot about a more holistic, more relational uh, uh, approach to coaching that still gets the best performance uh, from players. Um, it's more of a um, uh, idea that performance and development can coexist together. Uh, it's a more collaborative style. Uh, versus a more dictatorial style. Um, and it's holistic in the sense that we actually care about the players uh, off the field as much as on. Um, you know, the first reason being we, we, we want to be caring uh, coaches. Uh, but secondly, it actually helps their development if you understand where they're coming from, where the challenges are in their lives off the pitch in, in mind, body, and spirit. And that's, that's um, a, a really useful approach. So, so the coaching philosophy that I basically um, developed for myself is that it turns out that the, um, the best way to get performance out of players also happens to be the best way to treat them. In other words, they're not mutually exclusive. And so, um, you know, I have a caring relationship with my players. Their health and well-being off the field uh, is, is as important as anything. Um, I collaborate with them by getting them to talk about their game. So uh, if, if, if we're in a tough point in a match and we come back together on a huddle and a timeout, say, um, I'll really come in with Socratic questions. All right, what do you guys see out there? I know what I want to coach and I know what I want to say. But by asking them to express what they're feeling, what they're doing, it gives me more information, but also it lets them get to the answer their own way, hopefully. And if not, I, I'll, I'll interject. But if they come in and say, yeah, we need to be doing this out on the pitch, and they got to what I was going to say anyway, great, guys, let's go do it. And by doing that, you get more engagement, you get more buy-in, and you get more, um, uh, we call it lacrosse IQ, I guess you would call it Kamogi IQ, you know, that they now understand the game at a deeper level and can, can uh um, then carry it out uh, rather than being uh, on, their, on their own volition rather than being dictated to. Um, I set very high standards and hold the players to those standards and my coaches do as well. So none of this is holistic approach doesn't mean, oh, we're going to lower the standards. We're going to make things easier for players. We have a performance standard and we're going to hold players to that performance standard. Um, and, um, and then I think another point I'd want to make then is and I kind of alluded to it there is this idea that within uh, our, our system of play, we um, depend on players' lacrosse IQ versus having a lot of rote plays. Instead of telling a player, okay, on this, when I, when I say the word Yale, you're going to run into this spot, you're going to stand there, and they're going to deliver the ball, they're going to run in that direction. We've got it all charted out and chalked up. We don't do that. We teach the elements of tactics and let them improvise within that. And then we give feedback and suggestions, and they give feedback and suggestions to each other. And by virtue of that, they get smarter and better every day. Now, we do have some set plays because it's just good to have in your back pocket, right? Uh, but, uh, but we emphasize this kind of collaborational, uh, internal logic kind of uh, approach to coaching. Um, and then um, I guess I should talk about feedback. Um, you know, this is one of the big things in coaching is that somebody messes up out there, and uh, you've got to tell them what they did. And uh, my default is just to be informational in that. In other words, I'm just going to give you the information you need. Uh, you know, hey, Sally, I need you to drive a little harder on that drive, try and get a little more penetration into the defense, and, and good things are going to happen. And all I need, I don't need an apology. I just need, got it, coach, communication done. And, she, you know, she's motivated player. She's going to go out and do it. Now, I have 
a lot of meetings with my players, a lot of one-on-ones. I call them indie meetings, individual meetings. And I really spend a lot of time talking about how I can best coach you as an individual player. So one of the questions I'll ask them is on the spectrum of um, the feedback that it involves a kick in the pants and a raising of the voice in, in, in intensity and volume uh, on one side of the spectrum. And then on the other side of the spectrum, the arm around the shoulder, uh, the old sandwich approach, you know, praise and then the feedback and then the praise, you know, with lower volume, lower intensity. Where on the spectrum, you know, does each player lie? Because each one is different. And like tools on the tool belt, I can use whatever I think will work for that player in that situation. So uh, players will give answers fully along that spectrum. And you know, for some players, they'll say, listen, if you, if you, if you go big with me, I get small. And so it doesn't really work. You know, I just prefer kind of the softer approach and that's how you get the best performance out of me. Good answer. And others will say, hey, listen, if you don't yell at me, coach, you're not moving the needle. You need to, uh, you need to bring it. And, uh, you know, I, I work better. I play better when I'm mad. I play better when, when I have a uh, high arousal level. And so, you know, I'll bring the volume and, and use it never out of anger, but always out of like, that's the right tool for this moment. And this situation calls for a hammer. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring out the hammer. And sometimes I'll do that with the team. But like I say, the default for me is really just more uh, the informational approach. So I guess in terms of coaching style, if you watched one of my teams play, what you would see are players that are playing really uh, freely uh, with a lot of intensity, with a lot of speed and power, uh, and with a smile on their face the whole time. Um, one of the things I probably should mention is that, that one of the things I emphasize, especially in training, uh, is the idea that they, they have to make mistakes. Uh, if they're not making mistakes, they're not trying to get better. And if they're trying to not make mistakes, they're playing out of fear. And most people, when they play out of fear, get smaller and get afraid and get tight. And so if they go big and strong and play at 100% every time, then they're going to make more errors. But the point in training is to play and to train at that speed and then get the error rate down. So that when we get in matches, we're prepared. You don't want to, you know, train for no mistakes and then get in a match and now we've escalated everything, the speed and the contact and the physicality and everything else uh, and the pressure. And now the, 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 the ball's being misplayed every time. So uh, I, I insist on mistakes. Uh, and that kind of ties into the whole notion of, of goal setting uh, with the players. You know, we talk about this a lot that we don't do uh, performance goals so much. Okay, guys, we're gonna win this game, we're gonna score this many goals, we're gonna, you know, we might put those out there, but what we really focus on are the process goals. How, you know, we're gonna, you know, technically do everything the best we can and the result will take care of itself. So if we're not thinking ahead to the result, we can stay in the moment uh, in the game. So, um, so I think, um, that's been my journey basically in the philosophy that I've come up with. I think maybe the final thing to say is that, you know, I'm tr I've been doing this a long time and I'm trying to get better every day. I still read a lot. I listen to podcasts. I've learned a lot from you uh, in, in terms of the physio side of things, um, the strength and conditioning side of things. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get better every day. And I'm, I'm you know, any coach uh, that works with uh, kids or adults, I think that's their obligation is to not, uh, you know, I saw somebody do it. So I'm going to, imitate what they do. That's not coaching. There's an art and a science to it and getting better every day is, is I think a big part of it. Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair, and, and in fairness, when I, when I first came into the cross setup, it was a, such a different, a, such a different world than I'd been, that I'd been used to in terms of clicks. So obviously my background is Shinty and it's fairly similar to the G in terms of a lot of the time, you maybe have one or two coaches if you're lucky. So especially at the, at, at the younger age, and then you, you, you had, a, you had three or four coaches with you and that, that team, aspect but it was really the kind of the atmosphere amongst the, the players themselves which kind of drew, drew me to it because that obviously came from a lot of prep in terms of um, just in terms of in terms of feedback I have a couple of just points on, on what you made when you're when you're when you're giving out giving out the feedback so I know it's when you're um, you know if, if, if you have that players that player specific style as in you, you know how a player reacts to that did you, did you find that that, that takes uh, it takes a while to get through a whole team to actually know to know which style works for each player so I know coach is thinking that that could take some time in terms of getting through, getting through all the players and getting to know them. Would you find that yeah. kind of vital part or just, or just, just, just time that you have to put in? To yeah, it, 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 it's time you have to put in and it's very experiential too. I kind of made it sound like I, uh, you know, I have a database of like, okay, this is exactly what works for this kid. In the moment, I, you, you know, coaches are trying to create what's going to work here. And um, 
uh, especially in the direction of knowing when to escalate it with a, with a kid. Like a kid is just not getting it. They're just not doing it. So, and they're the kind that is a little more on the, on, you know, the softer, they've asked for the softer approach. I'm going to, I'm going to kick it up, you know, I'm, I, and uh, it, there's not, not ever a game a match or a training where I'm not driving home and going, ah, I got it wrong with that kid. Ah, that was, you know, that, that, that wasn't the right one. You know, I didn't use the right tool on that one. Um, and that's feedback for myself. You know, it just, it didn't work. But, you know, you have those stories too, where, you know, I had a player at the last world who uh, we, we give her a very specific thing to not do. And she did it, got pulled off, just got told, you know, information is my default. You know, hey, listen, you can't be doing that anymore. Uh, off you go. And she did it again. So now I knew she was one of these, the hammer works better pulled her off into the bench, let her stew down there while I know she's getting mad or mad because she's not in the game. And then when she comes back down, I'm now in her grill and then send her back out and she crushed it the rest of the game. So that's one that worked. But then I've had cases too where you do that escalation, they shrunk like a violet and, and, and it didn't work. So there's no, you know, there's, there, there's no, uh, you're not going to have 100% success on it. You just get, you take the feedback, you try to get it right as much as you can. And, uh, and making sure that the, the, you know, that you're being player centric along with the performance centric, you know, at the same time, making sure that the communication is strong with the player. So even if you did get it wrong, you can have a conversation after the game, say, Hey, listen, I think I brought it a bit strong there. Uh, and, and have an agreement around that. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's vital if, if, if coaches want to be the best coach they can be, that they, they spend some time getting to know their players and specifically how they react. Cause in, in, in the long term, you're going to get more out of them if you know how they react to a certain stimulus. I can, I, can I just jump in there, uh, uh, Stuart, to say that, you know, a lot of coaches might be watching this and going, you know, when, when do I have time to do that? Uh, you know, I'm, I, I leave my job, I race over to the pitch, and I've got an hour and a half with the kids, and, you know, when, when do I do it? And you have to kind of find these sneaky little times, uh, you know, like if you've got an assistant that's running a drill, and you're kind of standing off, and you've got, a, you know, some of the players that are subbing in, and say, I haven't, I, you know, I haven't talked to Sally in a while, so you, you pull Sally aside and say, hey, hey, hey listen, how are things going? Uh, uh, you know, how you do with the strength and conditioning work we're doing and just a little touching base like that. You have to sneak it in. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you speak to them. And in terms of, I think I wanted to, to touch on from someone you mentioned was about, um, about your, 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 your kind of fo coaching philosophy in general. Kind of sounds like if you're taking the, the kind of technical coaching frame of it, you, when you start coaching, you go from tell and sell. So I'm the coach, I'm telling you what to do and you do it and that's it. Now, a lot of coaches I've seen never, never get past that point on the continuum you want to get to the point where you've gone past that and then you're getting just what you've explained you're, you're getting player buy-in you're asking questions the players kind of create or you, you create an environment and the players then have freedom within that to do to, to go about the task however you want to that so again that's 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 the culmination of you start off telling them and selling them and then you end up with them doing most of the work and you just kind of guiding them by the end of it in terms of in terms of how long it takes to get to get to that point have you ever have you ever had it where you've almost pushed too far as in they weren't ready for that, for that environment and you had to rein it back a little bit? How do you kind of gauge what's right for the team? Yeah, I, I know what you're getting at there. And I think the key to that is to s start small and build, you know, that, 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 that you know, you're going to teach the, um, uh, the, the smaller pieces of the game rather than bring, uh, before you bring it into a full, full field uh, context. So uh, that you've got a drill that works on give and go, say, and we're going to get really good at give and go. Now that's an element in our attack. Now we might have a play that has a give and go as part of it. Now we can remove the play. Just like, hey, when you see it, you look over and you see her there and you know, you know what she's setting up for. Here comes the pass. I know I'm going to be the wall on this give and go. You know, then, then it just happens. Um, and in terms of the time frame, um, you know, it, 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 it does depend on the group and it does depend on the maturational level and things like that. And so you have to kind of, you know, give, give some rope and take some rope back, I think is, as needed. Um, but I, I had a session I'll describe um, that, that I thought went really well. When I started with a New Zealand program, I was coming in with this approach and they, they, tip, they had done uh, really more rope plays. And so this was a new concept to them. And so these were elite players um, who, kind of had a sense of what their role might be in my system, but didn't really know. And we'd already worked on the different elements, a high post, a low post. We've worked on uh, the various uh, pick and roll, pick and slip, all those kinds of give and go, those elements. And so I said, okay, let's start to identify roles. Who, who wants to do what within the system? And right away, we had a couple of players identify what's called the crease role, which is sort of a very particular uh, position behind the goal. Um, but then someone said, yeah, I'd like to try high post. Okay, great. So she tries high post. And she does it 
really wrong. Okay, so the next time we come together, I've been able to ask her, you know, so how did that work for you? So I got really tired. I was working really hard. And, hey, okay, so relax, because actually it works better if you relax in the high post, and then you burst out of it. You know, you kind of lull that your defender asleep, and off you go, oh, got it, coach. Um, and then another player realized if she drive, drove right into her, created some congestion, they explode out of the congestion, and good things happen. So a second player identified her role within that. And then she began to draw slides, opening up players on the wings, like, who wants the wings? And then a couple of players said, oh, that's me. I'm a high driver. I'm a high driver over here. And then pretty soon we had six players that had self-identified and you just throw the ball out there and they were crushing the defense and scoring in different ways every time. So, and then we come back together. So what worked about that? Well, uh, you know, when Sally um, uh, came, uh, came next to me, that was a little close. I could use a little more space there. That's now feedback for Sally. And so now she knows. And so it builds and it builds and builds. So I think in answer to your question, it's, it's giving rope and taking rope. That all happened in 20 minutes. And that's with, that's with elite players at Grant who kind of already knew what their strengths were within the system. But they co-invented a style of play that I'm not going to yell in a play to do that thing we did in practice that day. Uh, they just know, hey, you know, there she is at the high post. I know what happens now. Um, so yeah, it's that kind it, of yeah. uh, that internal logic of, of, of lacrosse. Yeah, so, 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 so in, term, in terms of getting from one end to the other, it takes time to get there. But, and sometimes you have to regress back sometimes to bring them on if they're not quite getting it, but eventually they will get there, but it could be at different paces. Depending yeah, on the group. It, it occurs to me, I kind of forgot, um, because we, we, we developed this sort of system in, in, in Scotland and there was an intermediary step that we used there, which was rather, we went from rote plays to shapes. In other words, we're saying like, here's the rough shape and now you can improvise, but kind of try to keep that rough shape. And then we went from that to true improvisation because they understood the shape. They understood the spacing and things like that. So, so it can you, it doesn't have to go from rope plays to, uh, uh, to to just let them go. Uh, I did a presentation on this at the U.S. Lacrosse Convention last year, and I'm sorry I didn't bring up the video. I probably should have, but it's a video of like uh, chickens being released from their coop and they're just all running around. So that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's not it. Yeah. We call, we literally call it chickens. That's a, like yeah. I guess that looked like chickens. We're yeah. all running around without intention. So every player needs to have an intention to every move they make. We try to help them understand what those what that intention might be. It's about spacing. It's about um, uh, working uh, two man game, three man game, those kinds of things. I, I, I just, I'm, I'm just imagining every single under seven, seven and under eights coach just looking at just just nodding, agreeing, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's their life twice a week, every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah um, I've been there. So I think the last thing I would to pick your brains on that would have been um, in terms of if you have so if you have a group that you've kind of you've taken all the way to the top where they're 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 fairly self self sufficient self um, they can they can devise their own plays they can improvise by themselves they've been they've been around for a long time and they're an experienced group if you then, and then think in that transition so say some of them start to fall off you've got a couple of them left and you're trying to feed some new players into that system. Um, is there is there kind of is there ways that you've learned the best way to go about that? Because it's probably something that happens quite a lot with teams. They have an experienced team, they win a fair bit, and then all of a sudden they, a few of them start to retire. You're trying to replace them in. So is there is there is there issues you've had with that? Is there ways you, ways you, ways you go about it? Yeah, a a absolutely. And and like like most things, communication is is the answer. In other words, uh, here we are, guys. We're in transition. Um, we've got a set that that knows what we're trying to do. We have a set that doesn't. And this feedback system is coach to player, but it's also player to player. So so your teammates need to know. You know, like if 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 our defense has just been scored on. There's a little moment in lacrosse where they can actually have like a 10 second, 15 second meeting where they can give feedback. That's your chance to go in and say to your teammate, hey, you got to close that, that slide earlier. And uh, we teach our players to communicate in the way the coaches communicate. It's just information only without a, a motion. We, we, there just doesn't need to be an emotional element to it. Like, uh, and, and again, the teammate's not going, oh, you cow, why, why, are you, why are you calling me out on this? It's like our team culture is got it you know, and, 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 and we're going to go do it. So, so by acknowledging to the teammates that, hey, we're going to have to bring these players into what we do, and it, all, it, it happens more player to player than it actually does uh, player to coach. Uh, okay. you know, they'll understand that, you know, we'll teach them the techniques uh, and the little tactical elements of things like give and go and pick and roll and things like that. And then they kind of almost invent how to put it together. 
what's going on. And, 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 and did, you, did you ever find any, any kind of teething problems with that approach? So I imagine that, that might be quite a new approach for some players who are used to kind of, if you know each other, you can be a bit more aggressive with people that you know and you trust, whereas them then getting used to a new system of almost being a little bit nicer to people. Do you ever find any resistance to that? And how, yeah. do, you, do you have to overcome that? It's a little stressful. Um, the, the new player in that system would think, you know, hey, it's not my team. So on, a, on the attack side, say, uh, just, you know, the ball comes to me, I'll just move it along. You know, it's not my team. It's not my, you know, and, and we have to teach them, no, you, you, you know, it's, it's important for you to start plays. Even if you're not sure what it's going to be, you got to get it started. And, and uh, you know, we, we don't have ball hogs on our team. We don't, you know, allow that kind of terminology. We want everybody to be a dominant, assertive player. And so by asking them to do that, they don't have the opportunity to hide. If you're hiding on attack, I can't use you. Yeah, you there's not a spot for you here. Uh, even if you're feeling a little uncomfortable, get things rolling and your teammates around you will show you how good things will come out of it. Because whether you're creating space or creating congestion, we've learned techniques to use it for, for our advantage. And so it's stressful for those players, I grant. Um, but we try to uh, create a culture where the feedback is positive and uh, early and minimally emotionally neutral. So they get the information they need come along pretty quickly, hopefully. Yeah, okay. And then the, the last part on that is, you know, the, 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 the culture was the one thing that kind of struck me in terms of the cross. It's very, it's a very, um, a very positive culture you create in terms of the atmosphere in the place. There's, for example, as soon as they go in the change rooms, there's, there's music playing throughout the warm up. Um, which would be blasphemy in quite a lot of clubs over here, to be honest, to have any sort of music playing. So there's music playing, there's there's laughing, there's joking. It's all positive. Everything is done in terms of the high fives and the body language and everything is always really, really positive. Is that something you had to you had to create kind of artificially when you came over um, to Scotland or, or was there was a remnants of that in there that you could pick up on? Well, we collaborated on it, but um, maybe the, the, the point of this conversation would be you know, what, what do you want as a, at least, a, you know, as I was coaching elite athletes, performance, you know, I want so what's the best way to get to performance? And it's my view that a relaxed, motivated player that, that is, that is emotionally ready for the match at, at you know, at match time uh, is, is better prepared. Um, and so I, it's my job then to find out how best to prepare them. And that's a collaborative process. So you, you've been part of these meetings, Stuart, where, where, where we're discussing the, the one hour warm up on the pitch prior to the match. Uh, that is a complete collaboration with the players. You know, what do they need to prepare? I know, and you know, what, what we need from a strictly conditioning point of view, uh, from a, you know, we want to build the warm up kind of point of view. We have our parameters, but within those parameters, uh, hey, are we doing, you know, seven minutes of shooting or nine minutes of shooting? What, what, what works best for you guys in terms of your preparation? You know, too much shooting, I get a little bored. Well, there we go. We're going to shorten it up and we're going to do something else. So, um, so uh, being collaborative in, in all that, because performance is the main idea. Music in the changing room, um, you know, it, it uh, for my teams, it, it, it got them ready. Uh, and for other teams, maybe it doesn't, but that's what you have to talk to your players about. Um, I also have um, uh, the principle that players are responsible for their own preparation. So if we go out onto the pitch and it's shooting time and somebody's just not in the right headspace for whatever reason, you know, twisted an ankle, they need to see Stuart. They, they um, just, they feel like they need a little time in their own head. They can walk off and do that. You know, so, because I, you know, I don't want any player to go, oh, I just wasn't into the warm up, and therefore I didn't have a good game. I don't want any excuses like that. It's like, you're responsible for your preparation, what you need, you do. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the performance tells you whether you were right or not. So the players are, you know, chatty and listening to music in the changing room and go out and have a piss poor game. It's one of the things you'll go back and talk to them about. Uh, you know, did, did that affect our game? You know, is it a, do we need to tighten things up? Uh, because the performance tells you what to do in the end. Yeah, so, so, and, 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 and in terms of in terms of your as in your own ego and the, the kind of coach's ego, I would class it. Does that does that take a bit of a bit of kind of stepping back on your part to say, well, look, I'm actually going to be safe enough and confident enough that, to ask for the player's opinion, as opposed to I think some coaches feel that they have to be. I'm the coach, therefore I have to be seen to be telling them what to do because if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. I'm almost passing the buck. Do you think it takes a bit more of a, yeah. kind of a strong ego to, to, to let Com them do that? Comes back to that role model thing, doesn't it? You know, because we're used to seeing the, you know, perhaps the coaches we came up with or the coaches we've seen on telly, uh, you know, come with that more authoritarian approach. Bottom line is coach 
head coach is top of the pyramid. That's, that's, we don't discuss anything beyond that. We, we are the final decision makers. Uh, however, if we take a collaborative approach where we leave our ego out of it, uh, we get better results. Uh, my, my approach with my coaches and my players is best idea wins. So if I come in and say, hey, we're going to do this drill today, we're going to run it this particular way. And, uh, you know, if you have a player that says, you know, I was, I was thinking we might do, you know, a little more of this today. Good idea. Let's do that. If it's a better idea. Yeah. Uh, so everybody knows they can offer what they want to offer and bring what they want to bring. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm going to decide. Any head coach will tell you um, any decision you make, makes some portion of your player, maybe even coach population unhappy. There's somebody angry with you at any, any given time. It's a given. Um, you just have to have a thick skin about that. And just, but, but if you're um, transparent about your, your thinking uh, on decisions and communicate well, then you minimize the, the bad feelings around that, I guess. Uh, they may disagree with you. They may even be angry with you, uh, but they at least understand that you've you know, thought it through and communicated it well, and that's the best you can ask for. There you go. Good stuff. So that's excellent. Thank you, Dave. Question two then. So that was the kind of coaching philosophy is fairly summed up fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, 